speaker is Linda from Bromwich Reed. I knew I remember that. <laughs> Linda is a systems engineer that worked on Hubble Space Telescope's fine guidance sensors for 27 years. She supported all the space shuttle missions to launch and service the Hubble and was posted at both Marshall Space Flight Center and at Goddard Space Flight Center. She received two NASA Space Flight Awareness Awards for her work on Hubble, the Perkin Elmer Technical Achievement Award for the on-orbit calibration of the five guidance sensor, <clears throat> and the Raytheon Engineer with Honors. In a previous life, she built anti-coincidence detectors for measuring energetic particles and cosmic rays for the Interplanetary Monitoring Program and Mariner Jupiter Saturn missions. Please welcome Linda Brown with Rita. So happy to be here. I've heard a tremendous amount and good, all good things about us. So um, I'd like to start out just to discuss a little bit about a brief moment in time, sort of like um, homage to Stephen Hawking with his a brief history of time. And we've got a couple of more uh, floaters coming in. There we go. And these are all mission shots, courtesy of NASA. So let's go on to the next page. And um, I've had a little irony here um, to the talk. First of all, Lyman Spitzer, uh, a very famous astronomer, advocated for uh, large space telescopes uh, back in the 40s. Perkin Elmer, uh, here in uh, Connecticut, was uh, awarded contracts in 1977 and 78. Hubble was launched in 1990. Uh, there were five servicing missions from 1993 to 2009, and Danbury's final support contract ended in 2017. So you can see uh, Connecticut's connection over 40 years, but um, it's very small moment in time when you consider the age of the universe, which is about 13.8 uh, years. Notice I put the little uh, approximate 13.8 million. <laughs> That's going to change. We know that. So uh, uh, the agenda for tonight, uh, everyone asked for uh, us to talk about the contributions that Connecticut, specifically Danbury, uh, made to Hubble Space Telescope. So we'll talk about the telescope. And of course, my favorite to find guidance sensors. I like to think of them as the workhorses for Hubble. Uh, the missions, the missions that we supported. I'll do a, a, a brief um, talk on the age of the universe, dark energy, and a little bit about binary stars, extrasolar planets, cosmic distance scale. And in fact, the FGS did quite a bit of work on binary stars, and it's not even a camera. So um, we'll go to what's next, and then maybe some musings if we have time from an old systems engineer. So back in April of uh, 1990, uh, the shuttle and the shuttle crew uh, carried into orbit probably the most significant science spacecraft of the 20th century and well into the 21st century. And of course, that was Hubble. Hubble is named after Edwin Hubble, who was one of the discoverers, I think Lou Marchand, also discovered that the universe was expanding. And so um, Hubble Space Telescope continues that legacy with a few twists that we'll talk about later. And Danbury Technologies and Design Robustness, as you'll see in a minute, actually helped to propel Hubble well into its 31st year. Next slide, please. Thank you, sir. No, it got things floating in and out. Sorry about that. Well, um, and you can click again. There we go. The telescope requirements. Uh, it was a heavy little bugger. Uh, at uh, 12,000 um, kilograms, length of 13 uh, meters. That's about the size of a school bus. So it was pretty, it is pretty big. Focal length, 57.6 meters. Primary mirror, 2.4 meters. 0.3 meters for the secondary. 
And the pointing accuracy, this is the total pointing accuracy of the pointing control system in general was seven milli arc seconds. If you were to, um, uh, this is like a laser locking on to the head of a dime 200 miles away. So it was pretty spectacular even back in those days. And I also have um, the magnitude range. I have stars, little stars on these because Alex will. Um, I've added a few slides for some uh, clarification. And the wavelengths there that you see, I've got it both in angstroms and in microns. Back in the dinosaur days, we used to work in angstroms as far as wavelengths went. So uh, next slide. Uh, this just gives you the optical path of, of a refractor telescope in particular. This is Hubble. So light comes in from galaxies or stars or wherever, hits the big bucket, the primary mirror, uh, bounces off the secondary and focuses down uh, into the instruments where we have several sets of instruments. We have four radial instruments back there. And in addition, we've got four axial instruments. And a click, one more click. And this would be the field of view if you were to, uh, of course, uh, turn the telescope and uh, at 90 degrees. What you see here are the instruments and on the outer edges are the uh, three fine guidance sensors, which have a huge fields of view, like 69, square arc minutes each, but you need that to find the guide stars for your particular observations. Uh, the astronomers called these three uh, fine guide sensors pickles, kind of like burpees. Anyway, so next, next slide shows uh, uh, the magnitude or bright relative brightnesses of stars. Uh, the human eye, I think, can see down to sixth magnitude on a good night, probably out west. So if you look at some of the fainter stars in the Pleiades, that might be what you see. And Hubble observes uh, objects to the 28th magnitude, which is a million times fainter than what we can see with our eyes. In fact, I, I just read recently that um, some of the observations went down to 30th magnitude, but that's you know several uh, overlapping plates, if you will. In the old days, and then and now you can see here kind of the relative brightness of stars. You see Sirius here, at minus whatever two. Or I forgot what the um, absolute or the uh, brightness is, but it's very bright. It's the dog star, which is right next to Orion in the winter. And you see the big red Betelgeuse uh, a little further along. And then finally, way at the end, you see Keck and Hubble Space Telescope as far as what they can see. Okay, and then finally, we've got the final sets of requirements here. Uh, angular resolution, how you can resolve two stars. Um, the orbit is at 340 miles in Leo. Leo means uh, low Earth orbit. Orbit's about once every 95 minutes. And the mission life was supposedly 10 to 15 years. Uh, we've gone well beyond that. And why is that? Because of uh, all the replacements that have occurred uh, in the five servicing missions to Hubble. It's hard to design something like that where uh, um, you, you have to design uh, replacement, which we used to call ORUable, orbital replacement unitable, uh, but it ended up being worth it in the long run. So um, the, the telescope is both a spacecraft and a telescope. One more click out. Thank you, sir. And um, it was a combination of two corporations, Perkinomer and Lockheed Martin. Lockheed built around or wrapped around the spacecraft part, and we made uh, in Danbury the telescope part. So I've just added here the list of what would be in the spacecraft your power, your communication systems, your um, at command and the control of the science instrument. <clears throat> You'll hear me talk about it, I see, SIC and DH. That was the system in March that had the great, uh, the large problem. I think they were offline for what, a month, Frank? Remember? Frank also back there worked on Hubble Space Telescope. So, uh, 
So it was offline for a month. And the really cool thing, is, I'm sorry that it was offline, but for all those years, um, the whole system was working on what we call the primary side. There's a primary and the redundant side for electronics. And they had to flip the whole system over onto the redundant side in March. You can imagine the risk analysis that they had to go through for that, but it was successful. It was great. And of course, there's another separate computer for the health and safety and porting control of the system. And that is a, all right, are you ready? Don't laugh. It's a 486. Anybody remember? <laughs> <laughs> but it's still working. And, and that computer also controls the point control system, reaction rails, gyros, torquers, um, uh, magnetometers, star trackers, and the fine guidance sensors. But we built the fine guidance sensors. Next one, Alex. Uh, all right. Thank you. So if you um, take back the onion skin or peel that off, you can see um, what we made the primary and secondary mirrors. Uh, and the graphite epoxy, epoxy or composite metering structure and central baffle main ring and the focal plane, which was also made out of the, com the composite, which back in those days, you have to remember, this is like the early 80s, late 70s. Composites were a new thing. Uh, you know, they were groundbreaking, if you will. And we did the five, three fine item sensors, thermal controls and high precision latches for the system. So this is just uh, as a sort of a vignette that shows you a little bit about, you can see the primary mirror, primary mirror going into the main ring, the big structure and the heater system. Uh, the main ring is the big, the central uh, structure holding everything together, if you will. So here we have the primary mirror, main ring. Uh, we have, um, uh, the, let's see, what do we have here? The baffles, the uh, metering truss structure. And then here you see, this is the uh, focal plane structure here, which holds the radial instruments and the axial instruments. And then finally, they put the three fine guidance sensors in the, the radial bays. And also you can see the, the, this I wanted to show for size, just the size of the metering structure and also the focal plane structure uh, to the left. So um, as I said previously, design and use of composite structures for uh, the medium structure and the focal planes yielded because uh, you know, they were just, the composites were designed specifically for uh, uh, generating the uh, precise stability of these objects and also uh, had great round to orbit predictions of what changes would occur. And there were like uh, 400 high precision heaters and heater controllers and thermistors on the system. And these high precision heaters held the fine guidance sensors to 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit, which they needed to do because you'll see in a while how accurate the fine guidance sensors had to be. Well, here we are. The fine guidance sensors achieved a 2.8 milliarc second pointing accuracy. We talked about pointing accuracy previously. And um, this note, although I have to put a caveat enter here, um, a one milliarc second is equivalent to detecting the width of the human hair. Uh, 7.7 .7 miles away. Well, I found out like a human hair, the width can go from like 17 microns to 170 <laughs> microns. So, you know, you'll have to, the, to uh, bear with me on that one. And for science, the uh, fine dime sensors actually for astrometric science achieved 0.2 milliarc seconds of precision. Is that as was designed or hit the, the goal, or did this was this better than the goal? In reality, I think, um, um, well, like back in, as I said, the dinosaur days, I think the, it was 2.0 and then it, it was released to 2.8. But for sure, with the scientists, the 2.2 precision, because they were able to do uh, quite a bit of software um, management mm -hmm. on the system. It, uh, it really exceeded what you thought it would, what you thought it would do. Good question, though. Um, 
What an interesting thing about the optical coatings, um, while I was working on the system and, and being conservative here through 25 years, um, there was a better than a 92% um, uh, reflectance um, in the system. And it's probably more like 94% uh, versus 100% on the ground. And this was also measured through the primary, the secondary, and 43 optical elements of each FGS. So I thought that was a pretty remarkable statement. Uh, the primary mirror is extraordinarily smooth. If you were, I had to look up this analogy, if you were to stretch the primary mirror out over the continental US, uh, the biggest bump or mountain you would see would be six inches. That's pretty remarkable where I think what's our highest mountain like 14,000 feet some, something like that. So it was pretty impressive and not only was it impressive, uh, you know, just from that analogy, but at the blue end of the spectrum, when you have a smoother system, you get to see a lot more in the blue end because you don't have a lot of scattered light from that. We also have these specialized mount and installation systems called latches and rails and every single uh, axial bay and radio bay science instrument that was changed out, came back to earth, um, contained these uh, latches and rails that actually assisted the astronauts in placing them accurately into the bays, the axial or the radio bays. And the latches also had to meet stringent requirements because not only have they be aligned perfectly into uh, align the science instruments into their base. They also brought science instruments back in what are called the sites. Uh, science instrument protective uh, something, enclosure, whatever. But those were the big boxes you saw in the mission in the uh, mission movie that they would place the instruments in with the rails and um, uh, were played the rails and latches were placed in there with the old instruments. The rails and latches were refurbished and ready for the next science instrument. <clears throat> okay. So um, let's see, what do we have? I, as I said before, the composites were a relatively new thing back in the 1970s. The metering trust, which was interesting here, remember Hubble orbits uh, the Earth every 95 minutes, it has to go through that terminus or term the day-night transition. And that day-night transition is uh, you know, a large temperature range. I think I, I haven't, um, the 20, 250 degrees below zero to 100 degrees, I haven't verified yet, but I think that's about right. But what happens there is when the tele telescope comes out of the shadow into day, let's say, Part of that metering truss is going to get heated up, right? The other part is going to be cold. And what you could have, although we didn't, is something we call hot dogging, where one side cranks over and turns to the other because of the uh, gradient, uh, the temperature gradients. But not so with the metering truss that we had for Hubble. Uh, you can see here that the requirements between the primary and the secondary mirror where three microns D space, by that I mean this way, uh, 10 microns in D center between the two mirrors, and uh, I think two arc seconds in tilt of those mirrors uh, to keep the system stable enough to start observations pretty quickly once we uh, got out of the terminus. Uh, now, the other interesting thing about this, and this will go on to the, I thought this was remarkable that, um, because of the weight considerations, they couldn't add extra uh, heaters onto the metering truss. So it had to be designed such that it would meet all of these requirements. So um, I always have to read this one. Uh, so the design solution used a passively controlled, very low expansion, a thermalized graphite epoxy truss structure. And uh, next slide. And so what the other interesting thing about the truss structure, and remember this was back in the 70s, eight, early 80s for the design work, was um, the, all of the tubes, the truss tubes were, were made of, uh, of course, the 
graphite epoxy or composite with very low uh, coefficients of thermal expansion. Each tube's coefficient of thermal expansion, CTE, was measured. And what uh, the designers did was to place each tube for the least amount of expansion, they did a Monte Carlo analysis or model, you know, placing at each tube all over the place, having you know several permutations and combinations, came out with the best, the optimized uh, system for placing each tube. And also the rings that you see were also made to support or counteract any expansion from uh, the tubes. It's kind of cool. Okay, so the latches and guide rails, I just did wanted to make a, a, a alignment stability on or that had to be better than 7.5 microns. And um, they used a simple hex socket EVA tool, and which worked successfully, I think, like almost 100% of the time. Next slide. So, telescope was built to last, optical coatings, structure, thermal control systems, still working fine, latches at the last mission, mission work fine. And also, oh, the other thing I want to say the fine lines, electronics, and the photomultiplier tubes were made like in the 80s, early 80s. And it's remarkable, they still work. <laughs> and so um, the next thing, of course, that, that is near and dear to, to me are the uh, fine guidance sensors on Hubble. Hubble has three fine guidance sensors, as you saw in the field of view. One is used to control, or not control, but to send the pointing control system pitch and yaw information, and the second one is used to send roll information around the, uh, the beam on axis. The third one was used for science or for astrometric instrument. In fact, I worked with the um, Hubble Space Telescope um, astrometry team, and they also helped us a lot, a lot with the algorithms that we needed to, uh, to generate. But these are the kinds of things that um, the fine guidance sensor worked on uh, measuring the planets, planets, exoplanets, uh, mass luminosity relationship, you know, knowing the orbits uh, of two stars, you could get the mass of either. And that's really important for uh, what stellar evolution and stellar structure. And again, um, I'm showing the uh, field of view and the next thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is how the fine guidance sensor scans through the 69 square arc minutes. There are two what are called uh, star selector systems. Uh, you can see the arms of those two. They work in tandem to move across the whole field of view. And they were big pumpkin masses, I think like 25 pounds each with motors and a an 21-bit optical encoder, which was kind of, was kind of cool and very accurate for the time. Um, I think what, uh, maybe seven bit, uh, I forgot what the combination of MSBs and LSBs were, but next slide. Um, this shows you, which reminded me to tell you that the fine guidance sensors are not like sensors like you would see in your uh, iPhones or cameras, but were actually uh, like 450, 470 pounds and about the size of baby grand pianos. <laughs> and also uh, on orbit replacements, as you see here in this fantastic shot. Next slide. Okay, so I think of the fine guidance sensors as two systems. One is a star selector system. I'll, I'll let Alex another click, thank you. And the other, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, is the interferometer system on, just on the fine guidance sensors. The star selector systems, you can see star selector A, that's its optics. Here is star selector A, and here is its motor encoder. Star selector B, you can see its optics, which is a K prism or, or a prism, and it's embedded in uh, motor encoder B. So this was a big and heavy uh, tower system. 
So as I said, these two units swing out or sweep out the field of view. Um, there's a science mission scheduler and the schedule actually commands the FGSs to, to slew out. Um, so the next thing, uh, and oh wait, in the field of view, there's the pickoff mirror. Remember I talked about the pickoff mirrors in, uh, in the system. And this in this system, picks off mirror, you go to focus, and then you come up to this A-sphere collimated mirror, which actually collimates. We don't have a focus system that goes through um, the star selectors. It's a collimated beam that goes through. So the next part of uh, the, the FGS is the interferometer part. And there we go. And it's comprised of and one more click there of some fold mirrors, a beam splitter, and two Kester's prisms, and four photomultiplier tubes. Two photomultiplier tubes are for the x-axis. Two photomultiplier tubes are for the y-axis. And you get an idea here. Um, I have specifically highlighted uh, this mirror here because for the final mission, the last FGS. Uh, one of our uh, genius optical uh, engineers, Bill Smack, was able to, uh, in his design and analysis, uh, mechanize this whole mirror so we could align the FGS a little bit better to right. do the issues that we had with sphere collaboration. So we also had a filter wheel, which had a neutral density filter, I think an ND5, um, two thirds aperture, and yellow and a red filter. And the, the neutral density filter and the what I call the aperture stop or two thirds aperture came in very handy, handy for several reasons. One reason was um, in because of sphere collaboration, it did affect the um, system. So the two thirds aperture stopped down on spherical and uh, puffed up the signal quite a bit. Now you lose some magnitude when you do that, but we also found out that, well, the um, FGSs work better than we thought they would because instead of going down to 14.5 magnitude for the fan guide stars, went down to 15, no problem. So that worked out really well. And then um, the, let's see, the neutral density filter was used for brighter stars because the PMTs were, were very sensitive and uh, you had to be careful to go from ninth magnitude, well, for guidance down to 15, the astronomers went from ninth magnitude to 18th magnitude. So they uh, were very happy with uh, uh, how the PMTs work. So let's go on to the next chart. And this kind of shows you, um, like I said before, the FGSs are not cameras but they work with interferometric techniques. The Kester's prism, um, the light from the collimated beam, which is about a 42 millimeter beam, hits the Kester's prism and then it's split, a quarter wave split. So if you have constructive interference from the wave by, easy way to think of construction, constructive interference, that you have two tsunamis, two waves coming at each other and they hit each other um, uh, on top of each other, the wave goes even higher. That's that's constructive interference. If one wave is high, the other wave is a trough, they null out. That's destructive interference. Well, that's what happens with the Kester's prism. One PMT can sense um, uh, the brighter side, and one PMT uh, can sense the, the the fainter side. And what you get uh, is this signal that you see here. And at the zero point, that is where the FGS is um, uh, wanted to be. If they went up one side, they would send that signal to the point and control system and say, move back. On the other side, they would say, okay, you've got to move in the other direction. And remember, that's X and Y directions for um, each FGS, the one that controlled pitch and L and the one that controlled roll. Okay, so. Um, the clever astronomers, this is uh, sort of a nice uh, S-curve, we call an S-curve, but occasionally we would see something like this. And the astronomers had um, a family of S-curves. 
when, what you see here is really a combination of two stars, a binary system. And from that, they could tell the masses of the stars and the brightnesses. We also had, um, when uh, we first went on orbit, of course, we had the issues with spherical aberration, but we also had other issues. The poor FGSs had to deal with um, Hubble quakes. Do you remember that? Do you remember what caused Hubble quakes? The solar rays. Yeah, they had they had some uh, issues with the solar rays at that time, and so you would the FGSs would show that signal. They you know they did um, for monitoring earthquakes, um, and all, oftentimes they couldn't stay locked onto the star. But that was no that wasn't a problem because the FGSs would use one of their modes. They had a um, a search mode, a poor track mode, and then the find mode that you see here where they um, sit at the zero position and use inter interfer interferometric techniques. In coarse track mode, they would mutate around, the, the FGS would mutate around the star and collect an error signal. And that error signal would be about 20 milliarc seconds, which at that time was probably good enough for um, some of the observations. So it, it was very, um, I guess I want to say adaptable, all three FGSs. So um, the FGSs were also built with a composite and which had to have a keel uh, where basically all the optics were uh, to be very stable and also um, to, so that we had um, an ideal idea of ground to orbit changes that would occur. And also the thermal design well, use things like radiators and heat straps and uh, thermistors and um, isol radiative isolation to keep the temperature of the FGS is at 0.1 degrees. So um, let's see, the Edinburgh personnel uh, participated in every mission to Hubble. And these are the sorts of things we did, focus and wafer, phase retrieval, the optical field angle distortion calibration, which uh, when I talk about distortion, I don't mean like coma or astigmatism. I mean more like field dependent, uh, uh, magnitude dependent uh, aberrations. So even though your magnification is one number at certain field points, it can change. So the true position of the star is somewhere else versus where you think it is. And also we do things like the FGS and the FGE checkouts, which was very exciting when an astronaut puts an FGS into its bay, you've got like five minutes of terror to check out that FGS, make sure it's okay and tell them, okay, it's good. So, you know, we would be kind of bored for several hours and then heads up, it's coming. And you really had to be crisp uh, because you know these were folks' lives that depended on you to um, give them a yay or nay. And many team members during the, uh, the mission launch were away from home for a year. So uh, to get things uh, figured out. Okay, next one. So um, I just listed, I'm not going to go through everything here, but I've listed all of the missions and what um, uh, was changed out. This was a, a, just a fantastic mission. Uh, this was the last mission of Hubble in 2009, and the astronauts just worked extremely hard. I mean, there were times when they'd say, okay, you guys, you better come in. No, we only, we'll finish. We can do this. We can do this. So it's great. And, you know, it kept going for years and years and years, and it was kind of of a sad thing, but um, they did a terrific job. Next one. Okay, the science. So um, you, you've you seen the great, I, I don't know if I have another one on here. Oh, okay, let's go back one. Uh, the, there were several deep fields done. I think the first one was up like in around the North Pole, yeah. what was it? And for several orbits, um, Hubble stared at this area in the sky, and now we can go to the next one. Um, so I think, all right, I'm going to guess here. I think it was like 
right around this darkest region here. Mm -hmm. And they stared, and this is what they got, thousands of galaxies. And, and that is such a cool one. I just I just thought that was so neat. I think we have a, um, do we have a movie out? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's oh, it, you want to show that one? Please excuse the advertisements from uh, YouTube. It was the one that had them squares. Okay. So those are the brilliant galaxy. Now we're moving out. They're going further. <laughs> Good demonstration of magnitude also. <laughs> And there we go. We're in a normal star field now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. So on the next slide. Oh, I love this one. Um, this was uh, courtesy of, I think, the um, Hubble site. Uh, which I have some uh, really good light links for you all later. But you can see Hubble seeing normal galaxies. And notice how we go from the blue, the Hubble deep field, we go to Goods, which is a composite of Hubble and other uh, telescopes um, observations. We go to the Hubble ultra deep field and know how we're going, look how we're going further and further into the red. Well, as we go out into, um, the cosmic unknown, so to speak, the uh, galaxies are, um, the wavelengths are stretched out because of redshift. Uh, but Hubble can only see so far, so that's going to be a segue into something else. We'll see. Oh, I love this one. And then, uh, Alex, we got Eta Carina. I was like, my, one of my favorite stars ever is uh, Eta Carina, which is in the Carina Nebula, and I think it's this guy right here. But it's like, one of the uh, most massive stars in our galaxy. I think it's one of the 10 most massive stars. And one interesting thing about it is astronomers were, and I think still puzzled as to why it didn't supernova. The star is still there and burning away. So that's kind of a, a cool thing. It also lasers in the ultraviolet and it's one of the only stars that's ever has ever done that or that we've ever observed. So I don't know what the mechanism is that does that. That's kind of neat. Oh, is that the one? Oh, this is kind of funny. So I, I you know, I have to, uh, of course, give credits to everyone. Look at uh, John Morris's. Can you see this? Go boldly institute. <laughs> anyway, that was funny. Okay. Oh, this is a neat one too. These are two galaxies, and you might want to look these up if you're um, folks who are into uh, uh, galactic collisions. There are two galaxies here, and apparently they're gravitationally joined somehow. The galaxy on your left is sort of oblong. Notice the nucleus, the nucleus of that galaxy is not centered. And also, it seems like the, the arm in the upper right of the galaxy is stretching out. So I'm wondering, and you might want to read more on if these galaxies at some point have uh, it's some gravitational pull between them. The other galaxy, 2300, almost looks like an elliptical, or it's like an SO galaxy. So it doesn't look like it has a lot of gas in it. So you've got to wonder, um, you know, if it lost some of its stars uh, to the other one. I'm speculating here. You might want to look that one up. Okay. And we also know uh, from Hubble that from the observations of type 1a supernova and from looking out uh, into the red shifts in faraway uh, galaxies, that instead of the expansion rate or the acceleration rate of the universe seems to be increasing and not slowing down. By the way, supernova type 1a are um, 
distance candles, we pretty much know if the light curve of these supernova, we can tell by their light curves and by their brightness how far away they actually are, like Cepheid variables and our, our Lyras. So uh, the new thing is dark energy. We don't know what dark energy is. We don't know what you know is causing the expansion, but um, we're calling it dark energy anyway. And the next one, let's see, uh, all the age of the universe. There's still two ways of doing this. You know, the current, knowing the current speeds, the redshift of the galaxies and um, that their magnitudes and distances, we get an idea of uh, the age of the universe. And another way that astronomers and scientists calculate the age of the universe is with the use of globular clusters, knowing how many massive stars are in the globular clusters and their ages, et cetera. Globular clusters tell us that the universe is about 13 billion years old. And um, the current estimate from, uh, from <coughs> cosmological uh, systems is about 13.7 or 13.8 billion years. Okay. So um, I think this is, oh, this is kind of the same animation. We can, we can pass that. Okay. okay. And then um, we did science with the fine guidance systems and um, measuring the distance to uh, some of the Cepheids and the R. Lyras, and also using the extremely sensitive uh, sensitivity of the PMTs, they could measure light curves of objects going in front of mainly planets, uh, stars. So that was pretty impressive. And then also the FGSs and the astronomers, of course, also looked at binary, binary star systems and their orbits so that they could get an idea of the mass of these stars. Okay. And this brings me to what's next. This picture is, I think this is the monkey nebula here. This uh, picture to your left is seen with wide field two in the visible. And the picture on your right is seen with, or taken, I'm sorry, with the wide field three camera. Notice the difference. IR, infrared on your right, visible on your left. But can you see other things here? There are galaxies in this picture. If you look closely, if your eyes you know, kind of adapt, you'll see galaxies and other stars. Um, with the infrared, there's a lot more information because the IR, the infrared light, can get through these massive clouds, whereas in the visible, we're kind of stuck. All right. So if you would give us another click. Um, and the infrared is very important. You notice, and one more thought. Thank you. If you notice the visible <coughs> end of the spectrum, that's the electromagnetic spectrum there, um, uh, has a very little bit of information. Whereas look at the red end. The, the uh, infrared will give us a lot of information. Why is the IR um, so important? Boy, young stars and planets often form in, cocoon, in cocoons, and that light can't get through in the visible, but it can get through in the IR. Um, IR light can penetrate the dust. And also, as I said previously, observing distance galaxies um, whose uh, wavelengths are stretched out into the red or into the red shift is very important. So what does that mean for us? Well, that means the next telescope going up is going to see in the infrared. And that's the James Webb Space Telescope. It's still scheduled to launch on December 18th. 18th. And I have a few pictures here. Um, this one is um, getting ready to, to send to its um, it's, uh, it's, it's launching ship, which is an Ariane 5. And is it in French Guiana? I think that's, it's, that's where it is. Yeah. And here it is packaged in the, in the capsule. And then here it is unfurled. Um, and you can see, I think it points to some of the instruments, the sun, the famous sun shield, uh, the spacecraft, the uh, Star Trek, Star Trackers. 
the ISIM, which is the uh, instrument package, the science instrument uh, module, and backplane, primary and secondary in Europe. And we can go on to the next one. And I have some of the differences between the two telescopes here, the Hubble mm -hmm. and uh, James Webb has a, quite an impressive size uh, primary mirror, which has 18 segments. It's made of beryllium, why? Because it needed to be light, a lightweight system. And uh, I think our primary mirror, which was lightweighted is ULE. Now here's another interesting point, the distance from the earth. Well, James Webb is going to be 1.5 million kilometers, whereas Hubble is 570 kilometers. It just rotates in a low Earth orbit, so to speak. Wavelengths, uh, Webb is well into the red where um, Hubble is in the visible range. And the telescopes are a little different. Richie Kirtian telescope for Hubble and uh, which is a category with slightly different uh, hyperbolic primary and secondary um, to, um, to minimize um, aberrations in the outer edges, which is kind of what the, the three mirror anastigmat does um, too. So the next slide. Okay, there you go. So, um, oh, let's, let's try to take this back. Ah, there we go, thank you. So this just shows you uh, where um, James Webb is going to go to. It goes beyond the moon and out to a point called the L2 point or Lagrange point. The Lagrange point in three body mechanics is sort of a, a balance between two bodies, the gravitational pull and the centripetal force of the third body. And um, as one of my compatriots at work said, um, I, I was asked, a few people were having a conversation on, on James Webb, and as far as servicing it, uh, our friend at work said, well, Captain Kirk and the Starship Enterprise would have to service this thing. <laughs> so um, that was uh, Kevin Malone, for those of you who know Kevin. <laughs> and, but it is going to be spectacular. I mean, it's been years and years and years in, in the making, and I'm sure there are lots of mechanisms that on its way out to L2 have to unfurl, uh, but I think it's going to do some great science. I also have, ah, there we go, that thank you. The sun shield itself stays away from the sun. You need to have really, really cool temperatures for the IR, otherwise you get noise. Even we uh, radiate in the IR, so we don't want to be out there in L2 with the telescope. So you can see the difference in uh, temperature regimes with the sunshade always facing the sun. I, I don't know. Oh, here's a, could you click on this? Let's see if that one. This just shows you, I think, the orbit. And excuse you to the advertisements. So it's kind of a cool demonstration. Of, um, it doesn't just stay at L2, it, it does have an orbit around L2. Kind of neat. Okay. Okay, let's go on to the next one. And some things changed. I thought you'd be interested in this. Back when uh, we started working with the FGSs, we had some Kirkinola machines. I don't know if any of you remember them. <laughs> okay. And um, it's not to scale, but your um, iPhone probably has just as much power now or more than these machines did. And I have to say, I remember um, this was a tape machine and uh, you know we would record all of the data when we tested and the machine, you have, did you ever have washing machines that were like not balanced? Well, that would be that thing like walking across the room and have to catch it. <laughs> So it was kind of cool though, is to see the difference. And and people ask me, well, why do you want to go into space? Well, you know, one thing is just the pure knowledge of space, but the other thing is think of all the advancements that space does for us and things like this. 
Okay, the next one. Oh, this was the optical field angle distortion calibration I told you about. Um, well, that took several, it took uh, Kirk and Elmer it, uh, to, to, to do the actual error budgets and to show or help the astronomers as far as what they needed to subtract. Like there were several subtractions that needed to be done for that distortion that I talked about. It took um, Battery Space Flight Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, and of course, um, the astrometry team. I had heads up to those guys. They did a terrific job. But anyway, these were some of the partial differential equations that I had to write out. Now you just use MATLAB or STK or something like that, and, and uh, you, you immediately get the results. Oh, the next slide. Well, just like the astronauts, we, um, you know, we had some frightening experiences. Mm -hmm. We were in a, at Kennedy Space Center, they put us like out back in this really old building where you know, they integrated various instruments before the instruments were put in on the space shuttle. And we walk out at lunch, although you can see here, this is from a car. And we really did see at, you know, get alligators or whatever there are, crocodiles all over the place. And we also saw, well, not to scale here, and we uh, did see the cute little armadillos. They were, they were very sweet. And so next we've got, oh yeah, and we were at Goddard Space Flight Center also. So we took in the sites at Goddard Space Flight Center. And one of our favorite sites was the Rock Bottom Brewery, of course, but anyway. So that's what we've got. And here's some good links uh, that I thought you all might like. Um, to see James Webb has some spectacular site, uh, sites there. One of these uh, Frank gave me was a, an interview with John Mather, who is the director for James Webb, I think. And that would be for everybody to see. That is just wonderful. I also um, gave you all a, uh, this is a really interesting site on how the sphere collaboration occurred in Hubble. The guy, if you Google um, Curious Droid, uh, he has like one of the best descriptions of, of the sphere collaboration. And um, a good e explanation of HST Observatory is here and the science also, um, these two sites, the Hubble site and SDSCI. And that's all I have. No questions. I have a question. You're showing the fine guidance center uh, sensors around the edge of the telescope. Do those obstruct the aperture? Um, uh, no, no, no. They pick, they, they uh, pick off light okay. so that they didn't obstruct. I, I understand Hubble's having a little problem right now. You think they're going to be able to fix it? That's a good question. Quite a few people here have asked. They already, um, I don't understand the problem. It has to do with a uh, synchronization signal, Frank. You, yeah, I tried looking into it. The, okay. A synchronization signal from, I believe it's from the science instrument computer. And uh, they have been able to get the advanced camera working. That's been working for like three days. And I think the next one they're bringing up is NICMOS. Is it NICMOS? Yeah. Okay. So they're gradually bringing them back. They're, I have to give them kudos for all of the work that they do, you know, with, with all of the circuitry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.